and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Katie Beam, and on behalf of the South Dakota Humanities Council and South Dakota Public Broadcasting, I welcome you to the annual South Dakota Festival of Books. We are so pleased to have you all join us uh, for our virtual 2021 event. First, we'd like to acknowledge first and foremost that this program comes to you from the homeland of the Ocheti Shakuin, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. The South Dakota Humanities Council honors and appreciates the indigenous people who have the longest relationship to this place. Before this event gets underway, I'd like to share some housekeeping details. We ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout the event to minimize background noise. If you'd like to ask questions or share comments with today's presenters, please type them in the chat section on Zoom, which you can open by clicking on the conversation bubble at the bottom of your screen or in the comments section on Facebook at any time. And I'll pass along as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Also to help us continue to improve the festival, we'd appreciate your filling out an evaluation form we will email you a link to this form after the event. And finally, you can help the, keep the festival free by making a tax deductible donation to the South, Dakota's, South Dakota Humanities Council. Just visit our website, southdakotahumanities.org and click on the donate button. This festival would not be possible without the generous support of the numerous organizations and individuals who have already donated and are acknowledged on the back of the festival guide and on the SDHC website. And now on with the show. Uh, this afternoon's program, American Oz Screening and Discussion, features presenters Nancy Tysted. Copel and Virginia Driving Hawk Snavy. Nancy Tysted Copel was the founding director of the South Dakota Historical Society Press from 1997 to 2020. Currently, she is director and editor uh, uh, in chief of the Pioneer Girl Project, a research and publishing program of the South Dakota State Historical Society. She compiled the anthology Pioneer Girl Perspectives exploring Laura Ingalls Wilder in 2017, and she is lead editor of Laura Ingalls Wilder's Pioneer Girl, the Revised Text 2021. She edited and annotated L. Frank Baum's satirical South Dakota newspaper column, Our Landlady in 1996. And in 2000, she edited Baum's Road to Oz, the Dakota Years. Virginia Driving Hawks Navy is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, and she has published 27 books for all ages, as well as short stories, articles, and poems. Virginia is a retired K-12 and college educator, and she received the National Humanities Medal in 2000 and an honorary doctorate of letters from South Dakota State University in 2008. Stavy's recent work includes a reissue of her children's classic, The Christmas Coat, and a biography of her, of her brother, Too Strong to be Broken. So we welcome you. Um, we'll watch the screening first, and the screening we'll watch this afternoon is a 20-minute excerpt of American Oz, The True Wizard Behind the Curtain. Uh, the full film is available online at PBS's American Experience website, and I will share that link in the chat if you want to see the uh, program in its entirety. entirety. Uh, many of you know that L. Frank Baum and his wife moved to Aberdeen in, 19, or in 1888, where he opened a variety store called Baum's Bazaar. Uh, the store uh, failed in 1890 during the severe drought and depression. Baum started the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer and as editor created the column uh, Our Landlady, who commented on the things going on in Aberdeen. Um, in his newspaper, Baum responded to the news of the, of the then recent Wounded Knee Massacre and to the murder of Sitting Bull with editorials calling for uh, the total destruction of the Sioux people. This is one of the issues our panelists will address in our discussion today. 
When the paper failed in 1891, uh, the bombs moved to Chicago and Baum worked uh, as a traveling salesman, I believe this time for a Chinaware company and Nancy can correct me if I'm wrong about that. He also wrote stories for several newspapers and went on to write many books for children, young adults and adults, both under his own name and uh, several, several pseudonyms. And the most famous of course is The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And now we will watch American Oz. On November 3rd, 1956, Families all across America gathered in their living rooms for the first television broadcast of The Wizard of Oz. 45 million viewers tuned in. Its annual airing on television would cement the story in the American consciousness. My parents were dubious about television. Once a year, they lowered their inhibitions and restrictions, and that was when the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. To be Dorothy? We're not in Kansas anymore. You have to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. The two images that have stuck with me my whole life the witch and the flying monkeys. Absolutely terrifying. The movie is not only the most seen movie of all time, but it's the most repeatedly viewed movie of all time. I am Oz. It's almost impossible to conceive of American life without growing up with The Wizard of Oz. Melody, Melody. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz first appeared more than half a century earlier as a children's book. Published in 1900, the story of Dorothy's fantastical journey down the Yellow Brick Road was the brainchild of L. Frank Baum a writer whose penchant for reinvention reflected a uniquely American brand of confidence, imagination, and innovation. During a time of rapid change, he wrote a fairy tale that embraced the values and direction of a new society. Baum is at the center of a kind of culture of inviting people to dream of a new life. The Wizard of Oz is the quintessential story of going to another world, working out issues and problems, and then returning and being in a better place in a world that is challenging. What's underlying this seemingly easy children's story is actually a complicated person who has a complicated story and brings all that to the underpinnings of the book. His life suggests a kind of American spirit on the cusp of a new century turning towards what the modern and the new would be. Major funding for American Experience is provided by... At Liberty Mutual, we believe progress happens when people feel secure. That's why we exist to help people embrace today and pursue tomorrow. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Liberty Mutual Insurance is a proud sponsor of American Experience. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. The power of inquiry, the joy of discovery. The Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, driven by the promise of great ideas. Major funding for American Oz is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Democracy demands wisdom.
American Experience is also made possible by the Robert um, David Lyon Gardner Foundation, members of the Documentary Investment Group, including Robert and Maggie Brigerti, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Yes. The economic situation for the Baum family was dire. He was really on a shoestring now, very little money, but he used whatever money he had left to take over a newspaper. He tried to make a go of it, falling back on his talent for writing. Baum was very optimistic about his own talents. Whatever situation he's in, he figures out a new strategy for selling something or selling himself. Just a month after he shuttered Baum's Bazaar, Frank published the inaugural edition of the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer. Getting into that business is both a way that he can express his interest in writing, but it's also a way for him to paint pictures with words of the future of Aberdeen and the future of South Dakota. Baum was at pains to set his weekly apart from the town's eight other papers and put his faith in his own distinctive voice. Under the heading, the editor's musings, Baum offered his personal opinions on a wide range of topics. Baum's voice as a newspaper editor was an interesting voice. He writes about alternative religions. He writes about spiritual mediums in his newspaper. These are not topics that every editor would touch. The issue Baum most strongly championed in 1890 was woman suffrage. South Dakota had become a state the previous year, and an amendment to give women the vote would be decided in the November election. Frank's support of the suffrage movement stemmed from time he spent with his mother-in-law, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was a frequent visitor to Aberdeen. Gage was very involved with the Baum family, and she really influenced L. Frank Baum. He joined the suffrage movement because of her, and you see this play out in his newspaper writing. Frank Baum wrote editorial after editorial trying to convince fellow townsfolks to vote for women's rights. We must do away with sex prejudice and render equal distinction and reward to brains and ability, Baum argued, no matter whether found in man or woman. His respect for women, I think, is strengthened seeing these Western women. They had already succeeded in proving themselves as equals to the men. If you're homesteading, you are an active participant in the process. White women who are moving out into the American West are seen as bringing civilization to these communities. This is not possible without the labor of women, both the physical labor of women, but the cultural, social, political uh, labor of women to build these communities. Frank was determined to get the vote in South Dakota. He believed in progress. He believed that we were always advancing forward. And he generally assumed that other people would just agree with him. This great question involving the political future of our wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters will be decided for South Dakota next Tuesday, Baum appealed to his readers. The enfranchisement of one half of the citizens of this great state is in your hands. On election day, November 1890, nearly 70,000 men across South Dakota went to the polls. Women's equality was soundly rejected by a margin of two to one. What a reproach upon our civilization, he wrote, and upon the people of a state who have made a pretense of being liberal and just.
The drought that began in 1889 dragged on for nearly two years, exposing the lie of railroad promoters and land agents that the rain follows the plow. The great American dream turned out to be a nightmare for these people. And Frank Baum was out there witnessing this. And all of this is expressed in the opening chapter of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the great gray prairie on every side. The sun had baked the plowed land into a gray mass with little cracks running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same gray color to be seen everywhere. I think one of the most telling moments in Wizard of Oz is right at the beginning with the description of Auntie M and Uncle Henry as old before their time, as unable to imagine happiness. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. Baum, in many ways, is saying that this Western dream seems to have hit a wall. It is a place of great disappointment for many of the people who had invested their lives in it. On the Standing Rock and Pine Ridge reservations west of Aberdeen, Conditions were even more dire for the over 10,000 Lakota living there. And with access to only meager government rations, many families were on the verge of starvation. In the middle of this unfolding apocalypse, a new religion known as the Ghost Dance began to spread through many Western tribes. They believed the dance, which preached a defiant message of hope, would wash away the white settlers and return the land to its original state. It's a regenerative religious practice. It's not people yelling and screaming. Um, you do this dance until you sort of fall into a vision state and you fall down out of the circle and you have a vision and people come and take care of you and other people keep dancing. White Americans see this and they think that the ghost dance is the prelude to an armed uprising. Desperate to keep his Aberdeen dream afloat, Frank blasted rival newspapers for ginning up a false and senseless scare, fearing that headlines screaming of Indian uprisings would drive settlers away. After two years of successive crop failures, he wrote, comes the Indian scare. And the consequence is we are getting a very bad name. A lot of businesses were going under and the economic collapse in South Dakota was threatening his very concept of home. He invested so much of himself there that it was almost unthinkable that everything would collapse. President Benjamin Harrison ordered his Secretary of War to suppress the ghost dance by force if necessary. On December 15, 1890, Lakota Chief Sitting Bull was shot and killed on the Standing Rock Reservation during a botched arrest for his alleged support of the ghost dance. When news reached Aberdeen, 150 miles away, the townspeople feared retaliation. It creates a response of panic among white people. Newspaper editors begin to demand federal protection in case there's what they call an outbreak. Baum's newspaper ran wire reports warning of imminent reprisal. Caught up in the mass hysteria and watching his Aberdeen efforts spiraling into failure, 
Frank's usually optimistic rhetoric changed drastically. In an editorial, he praised Sitting Bull, but described the remaining Lakota people as a pack of whining curs and called for a vicious ethnic cleansing. The whites, by law of conquest, by justice of civilization, are masters of the American continent, Baum asserted, and the best safety of the frontier settlements will be secured by the total annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Baum thinks that the extermination of Native Americans is inevitable. His view of tolerance comes out of the milieu that he's in. It's really about middle-class white people getting along well. The U.S. Army dispatched troops to disarm and arrest a group of Lakota, including followers of Sitting Bull. Within days of these orders, the U.S. 7th Cavalry massacred as many as 300 Lakota men, women, and children at Wounded Knee Creek. Frank responded again. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. What Baum says in the editorials tells us exactly how Americans are seeing Indian people. There's no mercy, no quarter, no sympathy. It is a definitive and defining statement of intense racial animosity. And I think Baum is capturing perhaps some of his own ambivalence, but he is channeling a major and important and deadly current of American thought. I don't know how to understand Frank's reaction other than to understand that an either-or interpretation of history is a lie, that we're both and. L. Frank Baum carried that poison of racism in him that I carry, that we all carry as settlers. The drought the despair and the foreclosures continued. Ad sales dropped and subscriptions dried up, forcing Baum to abandon his newspaper and make plans to leave Aberdeen. His Western venture had turned into another failure. City. It's always best to start at the beginning, and all you do is follow the yellow brick road. Dorothy goes into a land in which magic spells are part of the apparatus of governance. Follow the yellow brick road? And most of what she achieves, she achieves without recourse to the magic. She comes with her true grit. She just puts one foot in front of another along the yellow brick road to achieve what it is that she needs to do. There is a real American value of being self-reliant. And you see that with Dorothy. Dorothy really set the stage for little girls getting out of the house and going on adventures the way that boys do. You have to see the wizards, the wonderful wizard of Oz. She goes on what is quintessentially the great American quest to find the place that will bring her happiness, will bring her the things that she needs. The wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. I hope everyone can hear me. <clears throat> excuse me again. 
as I said, if you would like to watch the entirety of that um, screening, I will copy and paste the link in the uh, chat. Um, make sure I can find it here. I'll just do that right now. There we go. All right. So we're here with Nancy Tystead Copel and Virginia Driving Hawk Stavy. And um, Virginia, I'd like to start with you. Can you share your first experience with, with uh, L. Frank Baum, whether it was his books or, or the movie and, and your response to him? Did you enjoy his books as a child? Did you, can you talk about that? You know, I knew nothing about him as a writer or anything until I saw the film with my children. And uh, it was absolutely enthralled, just as, as they were. It was beautifully done. Uh, it, it was a very um, engaging movie. Uh, all of the adventures and the different characters that popped up and, and it, it was so well done even though it was a wonderful fantasy, it was very realistic. And, uh, and I didn't really find out about the author until I saw the film uh, for the first time. And I had no idea uh, what kind of a person he had been at all. I guess I knew that he had been in Aberdeen uh, and had a grocery store or something, but that was the extent of it. And I did not know that he had had the newspaper. So it was all very new to me. So that when I watched the film segment and his statements about well, how he considered the, the natives in the area as being so savage that they should be exterminated for the good of all mankind, I was absolutely appalled. How could someone who wrote such a beautiful story um, have such a horrible, feelings. And, and I wondered, did he have any conflict within himself about this at all? But, but apparently not, because um, the situation in the West, uh, Aberdeen was pretty close to reservation and frontier. And, um, and it wasn't too long since uh, there had been uh, warfare with the Indians and that had ceased. And there was still the fear that this could happen again, which resulted in the events of Wounded Knee to kind of end it forever. And so uh, when I found out what he had written about us, I was just kind of really stunned. And I and for and go ahead. And you I was fro you I, froze for yeah. For <clears throat> I was conflicted there um, about. Uh, whether he was at all, but apparently not, because when he moved away from Aberdeen, he moved away from the Indian problem and had other things to worry about when he got to Chicago, I suppose. So after at the time he lived in Aberdeen, uh, he probably never gave it much thought again. I don't know that. I'm not a bomb scholar, and I'm sure Nancy will probably be able to enlighten us a little bit more about how he felt about things when he got to Chicago and moved away from the Indian situation. But um, a beautiful story, a, a good writer. I did read his books um, and was impressed with his style and his skill in, as a writer and um, can feel a little, um, uh, a little jealousy that he did so well because I don't think he should have the way he felt about us, but that, that's my own feeling. So I, I, was, uh, I was appalled, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, I will uh, ask the same question of you. When did you first experience um, Baum's writing or, or movies and um, how has your relationship with him evolved and how did he become the subject of uh, many, much of your work? Well, much of my early work. Um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think I first encountered Baum um, when I came back to South Dakota after college and graduate school. Um, I had I did not read his books as a as a kid. I know I watched The Wizard of Oz like everybody else at Thanksgiving time, um, but I didn't uh, didn't read his books until I started looking at his newspaper and doing work on his newspaper, his satirical column, which really doesn't get mentioned in this um, uh, film at all, is really brilliant in many, many ways. Um, and very, uh, he, 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 his talent as a writer comes through very strongly. So that's where I started with Baum, is watching him uh, satirize the citizens of Aberdeen, uh, the American, uh, you know, American progress. He, he, he believed in American progress, but he, he, he used satire uh, a good bit of the time to talk about his, his rival newspaper editors, to to ridicule people who were against suffrage um, and, and that sort of thing. So that's how I discovered him kind of later, later in life. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I have to say that watching the film has always been one of the joys of, of um, the holidays. And I have, I have to tell a little story because when my grandson, who's now 23, but when he was three years old, we were watching The Wizard of Oz for, on TV for the very, his very first time. And Elmira Gutch, who, who will be the um, Wicked Witch of the West, is storming around, uh, yelling at people and Dorothy and, and, and everything before she goes to Oz. And my grandson's sitting there looking at the screen and, and I mean, his mouth was just open in complete disbelief. It was like, holy, holy, holy cow, how is she getting away with this? So finally, he turns to me and he says, Grandma, she needs a nap. <laughs> and I, I thought that was just brilliant for a three-year-old to, to be able to come up with that. So that's my experience with Oz. Now, um, to talk about this, this clip that we saw, I, you know, I think there's some things about it that are really admirable. Uh, I'm a, as an editor, I'm a bit of a critic. So my first thought is to think it's really pretty well, it's really well done. Um, he's, they, they've really blended things in just remarkable ways. But I will say um, that, that the, the fact that it's just this one year in Baum's life that we're seeing kind of skews our perception. Um, and it's important to, I think, to realize that Baum wrote about the American Indians only twice. And one was, was in December before Wounded Knee, right after the death of Sitting Bull. And in like the 6th of January, I believe it was, right after the Wounded Knee massacre, before all the reports of it were really known. And uh, so I, that's the only time. And he goes on to write for 30 more years. And he does not repeat that, uh, that kind of sentiment at any time. He just really actually doesn't speak about the Indians ever again. He, and so, I, I think at the very least, we have to understand that it's a situational uh, response. It's not a deeply held response. Um, but, um, and I think the other thing, you know, if you, you say that, he never said it again, or I say that, he never said it again, but that really doesn't change the fact that along with almost everyone else in Aberdeen and on the Northern Great Plains at that time, Baum is exhibiting what uh, Sally Rosh Wagner called the poison of racism that we carry as, as white settlers. But I think as the with the rest of us, 
Baum's prejudices may have changed. He may have grown as we've grown. And I really think that it's important because we will never know. We'll never walk in his shoes. We can't interview him. We don't know where he went from. Well, I've lost Nancy. I don't know if others have lost Nancy. Um, I don't see her video. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, Virginia, one of the um, one of the things that strikes me about this particular clip is that it provides a context in a way that I had not really uh, seen before of um, both the fact that he was, of course, um, such a bomb was such a, a, a staunch advocate in his newspaper and, and life for uh, women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, um, when the, the first sort of um, panic about the Indian problem was happening, he actually spoke out against that and said, don't get caught up in the panic. It's, you know, we're, we're only few, you know, fueling the fire. And, and then with that latter topic, we had, we had such a change of heart from him. He went from saying, don't, you know, don't panic to actually getting caught up in the panic and, and encouraging the, the genocide. And for me, and I don't know if it's like this for anyone else, but it's hard for me to, to sort of rectify the fact that he was such a staunch um, supporter of women's suffrage that, that makes me expect more of him. I will admit that's my bias. Um, and I think that it was uh, the uh, historian uh, Maria Montoya who, who said, well, yes, he, he very much you know, appreciated white women because they brought civilization and they, you know, they were sort of like, they were um, part and parcel. But when it came to native women or, or natives as a whole, that was a, a different matter. And so I'm wondering is, how is it, do you share that same sentiment? Like, like it, he had it, when go he ahead. Thought, when he was talking about how we should support the women and give mm -hmm. them the right to vote. Um, mm -hmm. and how, how upset he was that they didn't get the right to vote. And it was a very sad affair that we didn't recognize that women had just as much intelligence and uh, were just as much as of a human being as a man could be and should have rights just as much as they could. But then he did not, you know, consider Indians apparently as, as people. Uh, because um, he, he said things that were uh, totally inappropriate in the after run. And I wasn't aware that, um, that he had only said these things twice when, in, when he was in his writing. And the fact that he did it after Wounded Knee and uh, we didn't, I don't know what he would have said then. Maybe the fact that so many were slaughtered might have made a difference. I don't. I don't know that. But yeah, I there. As I said, I'm conflicted in how the, uh, to respond to him after <laughs> enjoying the Wizard of Oz so much and and all of that. So uh, it's a difficult thing, and and I can appreciate uh, Nancy's uh, knowing more about it and being aware that um, he had done other things. And he, who knows? We don't know. He might have changed his opinion entirely about Native Americans, or we don't know how he felt about African Americans or anything like that. So uh, we have sort of a limited view of what was going on in his life. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think Nancy, I, did you want to continue? Yeah. Uh, um, no, I, th I think I, I kind of uh, said what I wanted to say there, so. Uh. Well, we had talked earlier about how um, the uh, the idea, if it's possible to separate the art from the artist, and of course, currently we're experiencing what some may refer to as, as extreme cancel culture, um, in which well-known figures who, who speak or behave in racist or sexist or ableist ways are, are quote unquote canceled, and their books and their movies and their music may be removed from platforms entirely, and, and some folks would say these folks get what they deserve and others would say it's too extreme. 
what say you about about bomb with this with this uh, issue, Nancy? Do you want to move statues or... of heroes in the past? And uh, I don't I don't like it particularly because we can't rewrite history that way. Uh, you can get rid of all of the symbols of it and 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 uh, fire people from their jobs or uh, prosecute them for misdoings and all of these things. But but it happened. And I think it's necessary that we need to know this happened and that we need to discuss it and um, be aware of this happening so that uh, we can nip it in the bud before it does. I think um, um, the way we respond to these things has changed. We're more willing to speak out now than we used to be at least the younger generation. And I'm fortunate I never had these kinds of experiences to worry about. So um, uh, it would be very um, challenging to, to be, well, a teacher in a classroom again, to have to maybe address some of these things with students without, how are you going to be accused of influencing their behavior even? So it's a very uh, challenging time. Mm -hmm. Nancy? I, I agree. I think it is a very challenging time, but I think we really have to be, you know, have to be able to separate um, human beings from their art. Um, you know, what we're celebrating people for is different in different times. You know, we're celebrating Robert Lee, for example, for his role in, in the civil, civil war. Um, whereas with somebody like Baum, we're actually, actually celebrating his story. Um, and I think as human beings, we have to separate art from ourselves because we are all fundamentally flawed. And, you know, the nature of art is that it transcends ourselves. It transcends the self and becomes something universal that we can celebrate. And I think there is no doubt that Baum's story transcends himself. Um, and and it, it's, it's allowed all types of people, uh, you know, people with different sexual orientation, people from different cultures, different races have looked into Baum's story which is fundamentally a story about human frailty and human courage and have seen themselves. And I think that, and have, have adapted that story to their own culture through the whiz and, and different, there's just proliferating uh, um, interpretations of the Wizard of Oz. And so I think we have to separate the person in his flaws, his or her flaws, from the art itself. And um, I think that the, the fact that, that um, I think this film, something I, I really want to say is I really urge people to watch the whole film because this little slice gives you a real bad taste about Baum. And I think that the universality the sense that this film, this, this piece of art is so American really comes through in the full film. So I really encourage people to watch the whole thing. Not to say that Baum didn't write in stereotypes sometimes, because he certainly did, but he's, he had much more to, to say to us than, than that. And that's the message I prefer to take home. What, how much of his success did he enjoy during his lifetime, Nancy? Oh, he enjoyed, he enjoyed a good bit of success. You know, when, when The Wizard of Oz came out in 1900, the book was, was, a, was sold very well, but he, it was turned, he turned it into what he called an extravaganza that, that played in theaters in Chicago and then went to New York. Uh, and he, he earned a great deal of money off of this uh, process so that he was quite, 
quite financially able to do what he wanted. Um, now, he wasn't a good businessman, so he was going to lose that fortune a time or two before he <laughs> died. <laughs> but he certainly uh, received accolades and, um, and financial success. Well, that was good to know, because that, sometimes it's very difficult for an artist to have any kind of financial success. So I'm, I'm glad he did have some towards the end, even though, as you said, as a businessman, he didn't hang on to it very well. No, he didn't. <laughs> he did not. So he, was, he, he went bankrupt in, in uh, uh, I can't remember now, 1910, somewhere in there. So. so. And did he take up any other causes? Um, as he, you know, as he was, a, granted, he had a newspaper and, and therefore was, you know, had a, a platform and, and probably felt quite behooved to make clarion calls for various things. But did he go on to have any other, um, take up any other causes? You no, know, not in the same way. Um, he wanted, the way he first uh, made his money or started to become successful was he had a magazine for show window designers. So um, he, he, he really had a, an interest in and a passion for um, salesmanship, I suppose you'd say, and, and design. And he used, he used all of the modern technology, the, 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 um, the well, he might, he might have, must have been an, an artist at heart too, besides just as a writer if he had the skill to be able to design these kinds of things as well. He was pretty phenomenal, I think. Uh, yeah. So. I want to remind folks that if they have any questions, you can sure put them in the chat for uh, Nancy and Virginia. Um, you uh, had told me earlier, Nancy, that he, um, with regard again to the, to the, the topic of the clip that we watched. Um, did he ever have to um, answer to some of the things that he that he or to the editorials that he had um, had written? Um, yes, you know um, he not not the editorials about um, um, about the American Indians. No, um, that was a that was. You know, he overstated it, um, but it was a pretty common sentiment at, at that time period among the settlers, just because they were so vulnerable out on the edge of, of, of America as a, or the United States as it was at that time. Um, but he did, some of his other editorials, um, people did kind of take after him. He, he um, he criticized the fire department, for example. Now, I think it was pure satire, but the fire, the fire department took umbrage. Mm -hmm. And he, he criticized the local superintendent of uh, school and he and his students also took umbrage. So um, for those kinds of small things, yeah, Baum, Baum got some real negative feedback at one point. And I think his, his work on spiritualism um, and his his um, that was really not a popular thought in Aberdeen uh, that kind of religion the the, the Episcopalians and the Methodists um, preachers um, wrote rebuttals and so he 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 got into some hot water <laughs> um, but not for what we find so egregious today. Mm. Um, and I can imagine that this did not um, pass others by, but there is that um, positioning in the clip of um, the fact that um, the ghost dance was such a worry to um, white folks. And then he later goes on, it's, it's seen as some sort of, you know, magic, um, magic, let's just put it that way. And then later he, um, you know, Dorothy is, is 
and and there's all this magic in the in the the film and how I think one of the scholars said that um that Dorothy doesn't use magic she just uses true grit and then there's this other interesting this other interesting thing where he did um dabble a little bit in the the spiritualism so to speak so um, and I, I, I'm sure that was a phenomenon of the time, but again, how th there's a balance there of so, or there's so, so many sort of contradictions, it seems. Well, I'm not sure I understand what you mean about contradictions. In, in he, Baum was very interested in all of the spiritualism, the occult. Um, you know, there, there's a, in the book, there's some things about uh, magic slates and, 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 you know, magic writing and that kind of thing that um, Baum kind of explored those kinds of things. And in a way, sometimes the whole magic of, you know, uh, uh, flight, for example, and all of the new, Baum was always interested when there was a new um, technological thing, like a like a typewriter or not a typewriter, but there was like a mimeograph machine that somebody in town was showing. Well, he'd be right over there writing about it and telling everybody how it was soon, you know, it was going to change the world. Um, so there was that kind of belief in the magic of, of what they call modernism in this film. You know, the, this is the turn of the century America. It's an industrial, uh, technological revolution and he's he's very much believes in that and at the same time he believes it that that you know we just really haven't quite found uh the next phase of religion and he's 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 looking for it the advancing <laughs> wounded me he didn't see in a spiritual sense at all that how the the natives were reacting if that was any kind of a spiritual um, experience for them at all he, he didn't understand that or equate it at all with any the spiritualism that he um, may have written about and explored later on in his life. So again, he's um, conflicted. <laughs> yeah, he is conflicted, but it's important to, you know, I've read a lot of those newspaper, um, you know, he used, all, he had all this canned news in his newspaper. They said off of the wire um, and, and, um, I, he also bought boilerplate from news services. And you read that, and it, there's not a lot of um, um, sympathy or understanding of the ghost dance. Nice. It's not seen as a regenerative movement. It's seen as a potential uprising. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's hard to see into it. Um, um, and, and see the spiritualism underlying it. It's very difficult for a white person to do that at that time. We can see it now and we understand it now, but um, it, it would have been very hard. Now, Michael Patrick Kern, who's a Baum scholar that was in this, was one of the speakers in the film, he thinks that Baum actually may have been frightened by the premise of the ghost dance, which was that the whites were going to go away and the Indians would, and the American Indians then would resurge uh, and take back their old life. Um, and he, he said because of his belief in spiritual things, uh, he, he thinks that there was some fear there. I don't know, it's a, I don't know. But there are theories. Yeah. Well, we've got about um, six minutes left. I want to encourage folks, if they have questions, to put them in the chat. So we've we've focused primarily on um, on uh, his more, let's say, controversial editorials, which is what the clip asks us to do. And, and Virginia, you said that um, you you know you are conflicted. So moving forward. Do we do we continue to watch The Wizard of Oz with our with our families and and how do we how do we do that? Um, do you personally continue to watch it? Do you do you now sort of 
couch it with, by the way, um, you know, let's, let's I'll, I'll, um, I'll watch it again. I'll watch it with my great grandchildren and, and enjoy it. It's a beautiful story. He was a good writer, told him a wonderful story. And of course, it was all enhanced by the film and uh, a very beautifully well done things and ends up well done and a good ending. And uh, so, oh yeah, I'll watch it. I'm not going to let his initial feelings uh, influence how I feel about uh, his art at all, because uh, um, we all have different sides of us and, uh, and it may not be as extreme, but the fact that he was a newspaper writer uh, gave him the opportunity to express that, that the rest of us probably wouldn't have. So um, yeah, no, I'll, I'm gonna watch it. I, I enjoy it very much, yeah. And do you feel compelled to contextualize it or to provide any sort of explainers or? I don't think so. Um, I think, well, my great grandchildren are too young to even to consider uh, talking about that. Um, sure. I may, may mention it to, to the adults in the room. Did you know that, you know, sort of thing aware? Mm -hmm. Because until I uh, agreed to participate in this uh, program, I didn't, I was not aware of what he had said or what mm -hmm. had happened in Aberdeen at all. So it just was kind of a surprise to me. Yeah. Nancy, same question for you. Well, I don't, yes, I will watch it. Um, and I think it, as a piece of art, it stands on its own. Uh, it does not, in, in fact, uh, I, I think it, it talks about the human spirit, as I said, human courage, uh, human frailty, um, and I and I think those I think those things come through. So I don't know that bringing in the story of of, of uh, Baum in Aberdeen is necess is necessary when viewing the film. I think when studying his life. Yes, but in viewing the film, hmm, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. No, especially not when it's a children's thing for the most part. That's becoming more common now that there will, you know, certain explainers are being put into. Um, I'm trying to think of a prime of an actual example, but there will be um, like in older cartoons, there'll be an insertion of sort of a contextualization of the history that was happening when it was made. Um, and so, you know, one, one just wonders if moving forward, that's, that's something that we can expect maybe around these here parts anyway. <laughs> um, anything, possible. go ahead. I'm just going to say, I'm sure it's possible. Um, I don't, I'm sure it's possible. Anything uh, the two of you would, would like to add or if we have any uh, questions from anyone? Well, I enjoyed being, um, part of the, the progress here and uh, uh, the learning experience of Noy and then uh, um, I appreciated uh, Nancy's knowing more about Baum than I certainly did and didn't, didn't take the time to try to find out anything either. So I really appreciated her scholarship and, and enlightening us on what, uh, how things were with him. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Virginia. I appreciate your perspective as well. Yeah. And I do want to draw folks' attention one last time. Nancy uh, said that it's important to, to view even Baum in his full context. And, and if you would like to see the rest of this of this film, uh, I did put the um, the link to uh, the full film in the chat. So you can watch that online at the PBS site. Um, but I want to say on behalf of the South Dakota Humanities Council and South Dakota Public Broadcasting, thank you to Nancy Tysdale Copel and Virginia Driving Hawks Navy for sharing all of your wisdom to very learned and accomplished uh, women. Um, and it's been an honor to uh, speak with you today. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Goodbye.
Bye.